Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains just, just awful, terrible, but I'm so glad you're here. And today, we're going to discuss bad ideas. Just legitimately bad ideas. The things that were bad, are bad, bad. You like when I talk about bad stuff? And you might be saying, wait, 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 wait. Shouldn't these be just another worst trains ever list? And I guess I could do that. But some of these are just concepts. They were never actually completed. So I can't, you know, justify putting ideas on worst trains ever because they never came to be. A few of these did, but not all of them. And yeah, I could call them mad science experiments, but at the same time, sometimes the mad science ones are actually pretty good in the end, at least interesting. But all of these have one thing in common, that they're just straight up bad ideas that you should not actually do. And yet some people, even in the modern day, are trying. These are five train concepts that are just really bad ideas. Gilderfluke's perfected locomotive. Okay, I'm gonna be real with you. The only reason I'm putting this on the list is because I get this thing sent to me like every other week by somebody. And I don't know if people don't know that this wasn't necessarily a real proposal. Or what? Reputable sources say that this was supposed to be a joke. This was never meant to be taken seriously at all, but even in the modern day, there are people not in the know who take it at least partially seriously and say, look at this ridiculous thing that they tried to build. No, no, nobody ever actually tried to build this. For very obvious reasons, because there is so much going on. It was allegedly designed by Ellie Gilderfluke, and published in the Railway Gazette in December of 1931. Even if the image alone isn't enough to convince you that this was definitely an absolute joke, the text that actually accompanied it in the magazine is a dead giveaway. For example, it was supposed to have a high-power triple X-ray electric searchlight of 9,340 candle power to enable the driver to see around curves and through mountains. Okay, a new, vastly improved smoke pipe, or carbo wallop, for the swift conveyance of smoke, cylinders, and gases back to the firebox for reincineration. Which is an awful idea! Do not do that! That'll just choke the fire out, are you kidding me? Well, yeah, they were. They were legitimately kidding. None of this was meant to be taken seriously at all. And that's the only reason I put it on the list. Because, yeah, it is a bad idea, but this was not a serious idea. In terms of rudimentary analysis, well, I mean, there's obviously a lot going on here. But let's talk about the fact that, um, that the drive alone would actually not function. Because of where the side rods are linked, and the fact that the wheels are supposed to move as gears, they would actually conflict and push against each other. So this thing would never be going anywhere, even if it was really built. And no, of course not. It really was meant to be a joke, and that is exactly why I put it on this list. Only because, yeah, it's a bad idea, but it was a joke. And some people don't know that it was a joke. So, yeah, now you know that this was not a serious thing. But the rest of these were and are serious proposals. Oh yeah, getting into the modern day. So consider this a word of caution. The Mason Bogey locomotives, sometimes called Mason Fairley locomotives. What? No, that's not a, why would you? Okay, well you're probably wondering why these are called Fairleys, because you know what a Fairley is. Well, the American licensee of the Fairley patent was the firm of one William Mason, which is located in Taunton, Massachusetts. They first tried making just straight up double Fairleys, but there were many disadvantages to their design, 
So in 1869, they created a single Fairley locomotive that had been designed and constructed by Alexander MacDonald for the Great Southern and Western Railway in Ireland. The design had a single boiler with one articulated powered truck beneath it, as well as a second unpowered truck beneath the cab and bunker. And by bunker, basically a tender with articulation beneath it. Now, what's wrong with this design? It could negotiate curves really well, and yeah, it could. But the problem here is that, honestly, he might as well have just made a friggin' tank engine or just made a regular tender engine. These large bunker tank engines have all the disadvantages of a tender engine with none of the benefits of a tank engine at all, making them very questionable when it came to actual service life. And they were plagued with one of the biggest problems of the Fairley design in general. They had jointed steam pipes to the driven truck. That's great. Except, except, those jointed pipes had a really nasty habit of leaking steam just all the time. Way too much to make the whole thing efficient at all. Mason later changed the design in which the pivot joint for the leading truck instead became a hollow ball joint through which live steam for the cylinders passed. He also developed a sliding seal for the exhaust from the moving cylinder saddle into the smoke box. It was better, but all those improvements took up a lot of space in between the driving wheels, which forced him to have an outside valve gear. There were just no real advantages to this design, though amazingly, one example does still survive, known as Torch Lake. And she's in operation during the summer months, so hey, I guess that's some benefit over here. The Baldwin Quadruplex Proposal. We've talked about these before in terms of proposals, but that one was a much larger 2, 10, 10, 10, 10, 2. Baldwin's was supposed to be a 2, 8, 8, 8, 8, 2 locomotive. And what? Why would you do... Some people in my following say they would love to see this in operation, and... You know what, I'm with you there. It does not make it a good idea. It's a really bad, bad, horrific idea. The designer of Erie's Triplex was apparently not entirely convinced of that engine's failure. In fact, he thought that it only proved that it could work, so the only logical conclusion was to make it even bigger than that. And thus, eight cylinders, four sets of driving wheels, a quadruplex. That was the idea. And the locomotive was so big at that point that the steam would have to come from two different boilers, with a 22-foot section riding over the forward one and a half driver sets and presenting 5,800 square feet in heating surface area. It was actually connected through an accordion joint that also contained a combustion chamber to the 17-foot long tubes in the rear boiler. Those accordion joints and steam boilers, by the way, yeah, they always broke, so that was a bad idea, too. And look, 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 guys. This was never going to actually work. The amount of steam you would need to fuel this thing just couldn't be achieved in this particular design. The big issue that's been pointed out, and I agree, that the firebox area was only about 16 and a half feet long and 9 feet wide. Now, that sounds pretty big, and maybe for a regular locomotive, yeah. But for this thing? That was not nearly enough to fuel this beast. With two boilers, remember. The point is, this just wasn't going to work. And it was never built because, well, no one wanted triplexes. Why in the world could you expect them to want quadruplexes of all things? It was too much. There was no need for it. Even in today's world, it probably wouldn't be necessary. Especially since the triplexes couldn't go over about 10 to 15 miles an hour. Tops, depending on which design we're talking about here. I have no idea how fast this thing could have gone, but probably not very. The Hyperloop. Finally, I can actually talk about this thing in depth. Many people have brought it up and I've kind of tried to sidestep it as it's not really a history element. But the initial proposal is, you know, in the past. So I guess we can talk about this terrible, terrible, horrible, horrible idea that is never really going to work. 
And it's debatable as to whether or not this would even qualify as a train, but I'm gonna throw it in because the heck with it. But it's a proposed high-speed transportation system for both public and goods transport. The idea was of course picked up by one Elon Musk to describe a modern project based on the VAC train concept, which is an idea that actually dates back to 1799, believe it or not. The Hyperloop is not necessarily a loop in a sense, but it is more of a series of tubes, as well as the pods that run through those tubes and of course the terminals. The tube is a large sealed low pressure system and the pod is a coach that's pressurized at atmospheric pressure. The result is that it runs substantially free of air resistance or friction inside that tube and uses magnetic propulsion, or in some forms augmented by a ducted fan. And Virgin's been looking into it too. Their Hyperloop conducted the first human trial in November 2020 at their test site in Las Vegas. It reached a top speed of 172 kilometers an hour, 107 miles per hour, which I'd say is super impressive if regular trains hadn't already gone faster than that on multiple occasions. But the idea has so many problems that it's hard to know where to begin. For one thing, you're talking about a completely different set of infrastructure that has to be built for this thing. That's held back a lot of new transportation methods in the past. The nice thing about even high-speed trains is they still run on, you know, rails? Which I know are old, but, uh, they work. And constructing it would be incredibly expensive, and even getting it to work properly would also be incredibly expensive. And the whole thing is unproven, and so far, not at all any better than, again, traditional high-speed rails. And you're talking about sticking people inside a capsule within a tube and just rocketing them off at tremendous speeds. What if, um, follow me on this, what if something goes wrong inside the tube? Like, uh, fire or anything? They'd be stuck. How would you get them out? Even when a train crashes, I mean, it's out in the open. But this, by design, is entirely isolated. Also, maglev exists and is actually currently in use in Japan and is proven to be effective. Not only is it extremely fast, but it doesn't have to use, you know, a vacuum tube which completely avoids the cost and time required to pressurize and depressurize the exit and entry points of a Hyperloop. It's woefully inefficient to do it this way. I can't see it actually working well enough to justify the tremendous costs over pretty much anything else. Now let me just repeat that this whole idea is not new. Like I said, the first concept dates back to 1799 and pneumatic trains were a thing. And guess what? They weren't really used that much. For basically all the reasons I previously stated, there's no point to this. None. Battery-powered locomotives. No. No, 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 no. What are you doing? I am so over the electric vehicles. I am. I really am. And this has nothing to do with me being against reducing emissions. I'm for that. But I've always felt, and still do, that EVs are just a band-aid on an overall problem. They're not really a suitable replacement for long-distance road travel, and they are definitely not a replacement for regular locomotives. First of all, do you have any idea how difficult it is to mine lithium safely and the toxic cesspools that result from doing so? This isn't necessarily good for the environment. It's just bad in a different way. But let's get past that because, you know, we all use cell phones and they all have lithium ion batteries. Let's be fair, lithium mines are not going anywhere anytime soon and I get that. But multiple different ventures are going into creating battery operated locomotives. And this is just the most obscenely stupid thing. I've ever seen in my life because multiple different news articles are hailing it as a great thing. Electric locomotives are gonna replace diesels. This is the world of the future. Are you serious? Are you serious? Have any of you ever picked up a history book? Electric locomotives are not new and in the past we had a much more sensible way of actually powering them. Lines. Frickin' electric lines that run over the tracks because trains unlike pretty much every other form of transportation 
run on a track. Therefore, you can put lines over the track because that is where the trains will always be. Cars need to run off of the lithium ion batteries because cars go wherever they want, but trains are restricted by design. So historically, what companies have done is electrify the lines with electric cables, like a normal person. But no, the new thing is, oh no, 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 we're gonna make the locomotives all run off of batteries now. Yeah, and completely limit their range to an obscene degree? Lithium ion battery tech is not up to snuff for this kind of thing. Not for the distances a lot of trains go. But you know what is? A constant supply of readily available electricity in a wire above the track. Again, like a normal person. I've researched plenty of railroads already, and I assure you, pretty much every time a railroad opts to electrify lines, yeah, at first it is pretty expensive to do, but in the long term, the money saved speaks for itself. It's just copper wire, and the locomotives can just run off of the wire. I recognize that many of the railroads would have to absorb a tremendous cost to do this, but they could start now and slowly transition. And instead of investing in what I view as a complete and total waste of money, which is battery-operated locomotives, do you have any idea how stupid that sounds? But no, 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 Darkness, they can put a lot of batteries in it. You can fit a big old battery in it, and it'll go really far, and yeah, yeah, it would. But it would go much further if you didn't have to worry about a battery at all. And then you have to recharge a very large amount of batteries, and some railroads would have to completely change how they schedule their trains because they're utilizing batteries instead of wires. Railroads are the one element of this whole lithium-ion fiasco that literally don't have to deal with it. They don't. There's already a better method for doing it in their case. Why in the blue heck would they choose the batteries over actual hard wires? In the long term, it makes tremendously more sense. And lithium-ion batteries don't last forever. I don't mean just run out of power. I mean, they can only be recharged so many times and then you need to replace them. And we will run out of lithium and have to do something differently. But I assure you, there's plenty of copper. We'll just do it the normal way. Why are we overcomplicating something that doesn't require all this? I concede that perhaps in a yard setting, a battery locomotive does make a bit more sense there. It's hard to put that much wire over a train yard. But long distance trains? Are you joking? Even if they could, why would you? And I do also concede that one idea involving this does at least make some level of logical sense as a few companies have proposed the possibility of having locomotives that can run off of the lines, but also charge batteries for if they have to go on lines that aren't electrified. And you know what? I'll give them that. That does make some level of sense. I would be okay with that as kind of a transitionary method to getting to the point of electrifying the whole line and not having to use the batteries at all. But just flat out battery locomotives? I just can't see it working that well. Not with today's technology anyway. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Some dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsum 131-232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of None, Dr. Racer 78, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Hoth 444, Alaric Jaspers, The Baxter, That Guy with a Beard, Mark Holding, Mercenary Revy, Lock Kraken, Crystal Morgan, A Person 723, and DM Tribal Typhoon. Till next time. This is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.